So, uh, first off, uh, my name is Stefano and I work for Intel. Uh, I work on the Yocto project. I've actually only been contributing for six months, which uh, at Intel is about a day. You're about a day old. <laughs> Intel. Um, and my talk is, actually I was really excited to listen to Matt's talk. Um, and it was amazing to me how much it's going to be relevant in what I'm about to say. Uh, because what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about how I got involved in open source software. And essentially, I'm a case study. Um, so I, I want to talk about myself as a case study and how you guys made possible what I do today. Um, and how unlikely it would have been for me to be here, standing here, if you guys didn't do what you did. Um, so let's start with the obvious. Um, I'm not to the manner born, so to speak. Uh, does anyone know where that quote is from? <laughs> to the man. Should be British, yeah. <laughs> it's Shakespeare. So that's from Hamlet. Hamlet's complaining about the Danes, and he calls himself to the manor born. Well, I am not to the manor born. Um, I graduated uh, with a degree in English and French literature, uh, which prepares you for pretty much nothing. <laughs> uh, yeah, teaching. Um, so I graduated, I graduated from a school in Hartford, Connecticut, and uh, has anyone ever been to Hartford, Connecticut? Um, there are a lot of great things you can say about Connecticut. It's very beautiful in the fall. What I like to say about Hartford, Connecticut is if you drive from New York to Boston, you drive through Hartford, Connecticut. So that's, that's what I like to say about it. So I graduated, and uh, I graduated at a time where the economy wasn't exactly flying. Um, it was, it was, it's not the ideal time to leave college with a degree in liberal arts. Uh, so I did what most liberal arts graduates do, and I applied to grad school and figured I would just hide in academia as long as possible. Um, so I sort of did the, uh, the wide scatter approach to apply to as many schools in hopes that I'd get into a few, and I got into one. I got into Trinity College. And I hear what you're thinking. You're thinking, Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland, that's awesome. And you would be wrong. <laughs> because there is a Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. <laughs> so now you know two things about Hartford, Connecticut. Um, so what do you do? Uh, you, you just graduated, you have a liberal arts degree, you go back to what you knew, what you know, and uh, I knew the restaurant industry, so I went back to it. Um, it's a good way to pay the bills, it's a great way to pay off your college loans, um, but it's not an industry that I saw myself in long term. I knew I had aspirations beyond that, I just didn't know what those aspirations were. But I knew I could learn, I knew that even without grad school I could learn, and I had things I was interested in. So. This is a quote from someone who I think doesn't get enough play. Um, so Seymour helped write a program called a programming language called Logo. Uh, I don't know how many of you here remember Logo. Logo, yeah, go ahead, raise your hand. Because I'm curious. Okay, so good amount. Uh, but there are young people here, so I'll explain. Um, <laughs> Logo was a programming language essentially designed to teach kids um, ostensibly math. But really, I think what it was meant to do is teach them how to learn. Um, so a good example is uh, when you use logo, there's a, they call it the turtle. It's a, it's a triangle um, because graphics were that advanced. Uh, there's a triangle on the screen, and you can direct that triangle by using words. So you can say left 50 or LF 50 if you're a little extra geeky, and it'll turn left 50 degrees. Um, so you're teaching kids to program because you're teaching them that words equal something on the screen. And it's a very simple process, but the amazing things that kids produced with it, um, I'm, I'm sure I've produced interesting things, nothing amazing, but kids produce amazing things with this programming language. Um, so I knew I could learn, I knew I was interested in technology, I played around with the Commodore 64 when my dad was nice enough to let me touch it. Um, and I might have broken it, but there was the 128 came out right after that, so that was fine, you could just move to the 128. Um, so I had a basic knowledge of programming, um, pun intended. Um, I had a basic knowledge of programming and I knew, uh, I knew how to survive in the computer world. I could hold my own in a conversation. Um, so there's something more important though than, than knowing a basic idea about what programming is and, and knowing how to survive, and that's having friends. And Matt talked about that. 
And so this is a website from, I think, 2004, uh, which explains why it looks the way it does. But uh, the gentlemen to your right, the two gentlemen on the right of that photo, uh, are two of my friends, David and Mike. David and Mike, at the time when I graduated, were both programmers. Um, David graduated from Wesleyan with a degree in computer science. And both of these people were extremely influential in pointing me in the direction of both open source software and just software development in general. And I'm going to talk briefly about why. Um, so David was nice enough to give me, or let me borrow, uh, a Sony Vio that he had hacked Debian onto. And this Sony Vio, this is a picture book, I think they called it a photo book. So back then, this was not an easy thing to get Debian running on, and he figured it out because he had free time. And <laughs> it was a beautiful laptop, and it had the little gnome footprint. The GNOME footprint instead of the Windows logo. And that's the memory I still have to this day of, of going to click on it and thinking, that's not the Windows logo. What do I do? I guess I'll click on it. Um, he showed me deselect. Who here remembers deselect and how exciting it was when deselect came out? David Jensenius, my friend, was so excited about deselect. I had no idea why he was excited about deselect. Um, but he showed me how to load game. And with game, I didn't need AOL Instant Messenger. So I looked at this thing, and it could connect to the internet back then, which was mostly useful, and it could do game, which meant I could talk to my friends. So this solved my problems. And it had this terminal in it. It was weird. I couldn't type DIR in it. I didn't understand why. But I could type things in it, and as long as I didn't type two Ds in a row, everything went really well. <laughs> um, I did type two Ds in a row. Don't. Yeah, anyway, he, he got Debian back on that machine, and I'm proud of him for that. Uh, my, my other friend, Mike, uh, Mike, he doesn't even know I'm mentioning him today, but this is, uh, I don't know if anyone here knows who, um, what the Stanford Prison Experiment was, but uh, Mike did the website. Uh, for Philip, and aside from getting to meet Philip, which was really kind of interesting, um, Mike showed me uh, how to right click and say view source. Now I know I'm in a room full of programmers, so that's why you're looking at me the way you're looking at me right now. Um, but that's huge for someone, because most people don't get to do that thing Matt was talking about, and flip it around and see the code. And they don't even know that that exists, that that's an option. And so by doing that and giving me the link to his page and showing me that I could right click and view source, and then I could copy that, put it in a text editor, and edit that text, he showed me that I could do what, the same thing I did with Logo to the internet. And back then the internet was really, really new and cool. And so this was amazing. I was a programmer. I was hacking things. And I've got to do a brief aside here because my son um, has no idea what I do for a living and is thoroughly confused by it. But the other day, he came up to me with his computer, and he was showing me some website. I think it was Spotify. I'm bad with things. But I think it was Spotify. Something, uh, oh, it was the, uh, the one where you can tag things and say Pinterest. It was <laughs> Pinterest. And I had that Pinterest uh, dimming thing going on, and he was trying to show me something behind it. And so I right-clicked and viewed the element, and then hit that div and clicked delete. My son's face was you are a magician. <laughs> How did you? And I think, I don't, I'm not sure if the word hacker escaped his mouth with his tongue. That's the general public, which once you've taken your first CS class, you are no longer that person. The general public that I was, the general public that my son is, that's amazing. They don't know that that's possible because no one tells them, no one shows them. So I showed him how to do that. And I hope he gets in trouble doing this somehow <laughs> because I'll be proud to say that I set him on the path to break someone's website. So, so Mike showed me right click, view source, great. What does that get me? Well, it gets me uh, designing, web page, designing web pages, trying to design web pages, trying to do something that makes a difference so I can show somebody what I can do. He also told me that I should move because Hartford, Connecticut was not a place where there were lots of tech opportunities at the time. So he recommended I move to Portland, Oregon, where I now live. Um, and this wasn't really a tough, Choice. I mean, remember, I'm, I'm coming from Hartford, Connecticut. Hartford, Connecticut. Portland, Oregon. This choice was not difficult. Um, so I moved to Portland, Oregon, and I decided to get a job in the tech industry doing absolutely anything I could. Um, and I didn't care what that thing was. I just wanted to work for a company that did tech. So I got a not-so-prestigious job working in the tech industry. I drove a truck. Uh, not this truck, because this truck's 
delivering me. But uh, I delivered uh, legal documents for a legal copy shop that also did electronic data discovery, or the fancy name, computer forensics. Remember that, because I'm going to come back to that computer forensics thing. Uh, so I was involved in the first container technology, um, <laughs> delivering these boxes. Um, <laughs> I'm using the correct terminology. Um, so, but here's the problem. Uh, how, do you, how do you break that, I'm delivering boxes, but I'd like to program your computer forensic software, and I know HTML. So let me in. Um, here's how you do it. Uh, you scan the barcodes on those big boxes of legal documents enough to where eventually the program breaks. And you go, huh, that's weird, something screwed up. So you call the tech department, they come running down, they take a look at it, they open up my uh, SQL query analyzer, whatever they were using back then, and they run some SQL queries and they run back up to their tech heaven in the sky and leave you down there with the boxes. The next time it breaks, you open up the SQL query analyzer <laughs> and you fix the broken problem. <laughs> Fixing people's problems for them technically can get you in trouble because you're not supposed to touch that, but generally it won't. Generally, fixing people's problems is huge. And this is going to be one of the things that I come back to, because if you fix people's problems, you will go so much further than if you just do things for yourself, do things for other people. Um, so I did, and they did recognize that. They did get angry, but then they did give me another job, this time in tech support. Um, and I knew I could do tech support. <laughs> um, I, I knew I could handle it. Uh, I'd fix my parents' computer, my friends' computers. I, I knew enough. I could handle it. Um, but tech support, uh, especially at a startup, uh, computer electronic, or a startup computer forensics company can have its downsides. Um, so one of my illustrious tasks was to reinstall Windows 2000 on the broken computer forensics machines. Why were they broken? Well, because the computer forensics program ran VB6, and every now and again something would get corrupted and nobody knew what it was. But I was really cheap because my hourly rate was like $7 an hour, so just reinstall Windows 2000. So I'd sit on the floor in a room filled with computers that were no longer working and reinstall Windows 2000, and then the VB6 app, and then test that it was working. So I got a little tired of that after a little, after a little, a little bit. But luckily I had another friend, and this is another theme I'm gonna keep coming back to, is, is paying attention to what your friends say and letting your friends help you. Well, one of my friends helped me. He saw how bored I was, and he came in and decided, let's install something better. And I hope you appreciate my use of archive.org here. Because <laughs> it shouldn't take you long to figure out that's not recent. Uh, I didn't know what a SUSE was. In fact, I called it Susie, I think. Um, and I really had never even come, <laughs> I had never really come close to installing uh, an operating system before, and uh, aside from Windows 2000. And, uh, and this experience of installing Linux really made a difference in how I looked at my career going forward. And I know that sounds weird for someone just starting out, but that experience of seeing that there was something else out there and that I could do it, even though it was hard, and there were hard moments. I don't know if anyone here has ever run xorg.conf when connected to a monitor who's not going to tell you about his horizontal and vertical refresh rate. <laughs> but that's interesting. And if you had told me back then that in 10 years, I would be calculating the front porch and back porch for, LVD, uh, for LVDS displays on an embedded touch module. I would have asked you what you just said, <laughs> and then I would have not believed you. Because I didn't see myself going that far. I just wanted to be a programmer. Um, so so this, this was a monumental moment where I, I connected the fact that I had, I had potential with there was software out there that could help me with my potential. Um, so now we have to skip a bunch, because I'm not going to bore you to death with the years that I spent in web programming. Uh, not that the jobs I had were all boring, some of them were great, but it was seven years or so of a lot of work learning what object-oriented programming was, which is a little tough to grasp when you've never gone to college for that. Um, and learning how Java works, and programming in languages you never wanted to program in. <coughs> cool. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> but I got past all that. And I found a job where I could solve someone's problem that I was really excited about. Uh, I worked for our local university hospital, and they had an amazing problem to solve. And the problem was getting people information about their health. So the program that I worked with um, went to low-income communities. Their goal was to do the whole United States, but they started with Oregon. 
Um, and the goal was to go to these low-income communities and teach them about the basics of health education. So kids to adults, uh, things like cholesterol, blood sugar, healthy eating habits, and they needed a way to do this without pen and paper. They needed a way to do this in an automated fashion. So surveys are the, are the right answer. And quick side note to all you UX fans out there, if you design an application like this that looks just like a touch screen and put it on a laptop, a kid's gonna whack away at a laptop <laughs> and eventually break the display. But it's not his fault. You shouldn't have made the button that big and pushable. It's your fault. Um, so, so solving that problem wasn't too hard. I could solve that problem, but the problems got more diverse and more interesting. Um, so for example, uh, one of the events that I went to was set in a park and they had to run electricity in, but there was no internet. And there were 200 participants there that day trying to use my application that was suddenly not plugged into the internet, which should have never been before. Um, so these types of challenges were interesting, but again, drawing back to open source software and, and looking at what other people did helped. And, and the problems got even more interesting when you added hardware in. So these are called, uh, these machines are lined up to help people learn about uh, cholesterol and blood sugar. So if you're over 18 years of, old, of age, they could prick your finger, and with a single finger prick, they could tell you an estimate of your blood sugar levels, your LDLs, your HDLs, your total cholesterol. And I don't know if you know anything about normal blood draws and how they do cholesterol, but that's a really complicated process that's error prone. This is an amazing tool to be able to take to the public, especially low income communities. Like uh, one of the places was Madras, which is out uh, over Mount Hood, essentially. Um, but it's, yeah, lots of people get stuck there because it's sort of the snow can hinder progress. But, um, but one of the things that happened in Madras was I had a conversation with a gentleman who was a farmer. And uh, it was great because we couldn't prick his finger because it was so calloused. And I was trying to explain to him like what the process, well, because I'm just trying to distract him from them pricking his finger. I'm trying to explain to him the process of what they're doing and what LDLs and HDLs are, how important vegetables are in your diet. And I asked him like, what's the biggest hindrance for you to get veg more vegetables in your diet? And he said, well, pork is 199 a pound if it's ground pork but vegetables are expensive. So you know you're making a difference when, when you're at a place and you're, and you're, you're, you're seeing that sort of reaction. Um, so these Colostec machines had little serial ports on the back, or sorry, um, yeah, the DB9 ports on the back. Now, I know I'm talking again to a room filled with technologists. Um, so how do you gather this information without having to do data entry afterwards? And the C programmers among you are just thinking about sockets. And the Python programmers around here are thinking about Pi serial. Well, the web programmer, who had never heard of any of that stuff, thinks that you plug sockets into the wall and just doesn't really know what to do. Um, and there were multiple types of machines that I had to do this with. Uh, Colostec was just one of them. There was also something called a Tinita scale, which estimates uh, BMI, body mass index. And there was a blood pressure machine, which was really expensive for what it did, but did an amazing job at, at getting through like 600 people in a day and telling them their blood pressure. So all of these things had DB9 connectors, and I had to figure out what to do with them because the data entry was killing us. Uh, so what did I do? I turned to open source software. And no, I didn't know what a socket was, but I knew how to Google. And I don't know if the other Stefano knows this, but his code that he wrote, probably to just do Flash with an Arduino or something, his code that opened up a socket uh, and open up a web socket and a, a socket to the uh, to the serial port. That code that I got to play around with that made the data entry go away. So the barrier to entry they always talk about with open source software. This is your example: a web programmer that didn't know what a socket was did socket programming in C. That should both scare you and impress you. <laughs> Mostly, it should scare you. What should scare you even more is that I continued to do socket programming. Um, so. That was one of the big problems that I had a lot of fun solving. There, there was another one that came later. Um, so I realized at this job that hardware was what I was interested in. This is where I made the turn to say, all right, I love programming, this is great. Uh, there are lots of amazing programmers out there. I'm really good with hardware. I love plugging things in in ways that they shouldn't be plugged in. I love letting the smoke out of things. It's fun. Uh, it's occasionally expensive, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so. So I went on to, uh, to find, a, actually a friend from OHSU recommended that I come work with him on an embedded project. Um, so Reach Technology is in Lake Oswego, which is the fancy schmancy place over the hill where Linus lives. 
Um, and this company had been around for about 30 years and they'd been doing a myriad of things, but their latest thing were uh, touch controllers. So microcontrollers with touch screens on them, a really basic program with a, with a BMP loader so you can load some images on there. And then when you whack away at those images, it, sends, it essentially fires off a macro and then sends off some signals over the comm ports. But what they wanted to do was move forward in the industry and to do that, you need more COM ports. You need I squared C, and you need a CAN bus, and you need Ethernet. And so, really, you need Linux. So, my first question, and, and this is important when I talked to my friend Jeff about this job, was can I do this job? And Jeff just laughed. And I, I didn't realize it at the time, but he's laughing at me because I was bussing tables 10 years ago. Like, yeah, I think you can keep going. Don't stop. Don't, don't limit yourself because you think you have a limitation reach your limitation, and then keep working at that. Because unless, unless you're butting your head up against something that's too hard, you're gonna get bored. Or you're just not using all the, all the stuff that you have to use. So reach was a really interesting uh, career switch. It, it, it taught me a whole lot. It, it was drinking from the fire holes for essentially two straight years. Um, they did a couple of really interesting projects I'll mention real quick, just because they're fun and you're all technologists, so you want to hear about interesting projects. Uh, one of them was a berry sorter. So blueberries, when you get them in the store, generally don't have green blueberries in them. And they also don't have misshapen blueberries in them. And the reason they don't is because these wonderful little cameras scan the blueberries as they fly by on the track. And a computer somewhere attached to that camera says whether or not that blueberry is green or blue or square or misshapen. And if it is misshapen or green, a puff of air puffs the blueberry out of the way. Really kind of a cool thing to watch. Um, does anybody even want to guess what this is? Yes, I, I don't. don't think too hard about it because I don't know if I have permission to use this image. That's why I blocked out the company's <laughs> name. I just, I figured, well, you know, they sell the product, right? Somebody has to see it. Um, well, it's not rocket science because, because this part is. And this is what it works with. It's a communication system. It does voice over IP. But when you're in a launch center, the voice over IP is just a little bit important. <laughs> because there's a couple of million dollars riding on whether or not that voice transmission goes through. So you really don't want to use Skype. That would stink. Um, so, so again, how do you solve all these problems? How do, you, how do you approach a job like this? Well, I actually have one of the boards here with me. Because the first, my first example of how you approach this, example number one, break things. This has a toe tag on it. It has a toe tag on it because I broke it. I broke it because I, I understand what grounding something means. Now I really understand what grounding something means. So I'm going to frame this and I'm going to keep this in my house because it was the first thing I let the smoke out of. And I didn't even let the smoke out of the expensive parts. It was just, a, I mean, I could fix it, but I'd rather keep it and remind myself that when, you're, when you think you've reached one of your limitations, break something and, and you'll learn and you'll move forward. And the other way was with open source software. Uh, Jeff and I worked on these projects. Jeff and I, uh, together, had a combined embedded experience of about a year. How do we build an operating system for an embedded product that, that's going to move this company forward with one year of knowledge between us? Well, you do it by standing on the shoulders of giants. And how does someone who doesn't have a degree in electrical engineering learn about differential signaling? He does it by looking at open source software. So if ever you wonder, where's the example? Where's the person who, uh, who exemplifies all these things we always say about open source software? Well, you know, it lowers the barrier to entry and it, all these things. I am that person. You can just show them my picture on Twitter. <laughs> um, so one last, I'm gonna try and close this up really quick. Uh, why am I at Intel? How did I get to Intel? Um, I looked at the Octo bug page. I looked at the Octo bug page and I was like, I'm gonna fix a bug. I want to contribute to open source software. I've been using it for so many years. I want to contribute. And I finally found something I'm really interested in contributing to. So I found the bug list and I found a bug that was unassigned. Bad move. And I grabbed that bug and I tried to fix it and I couldn't. But I've been working on Yocto for three years. Why couldn't I fix this bug? Well, little did I know that the unassigned bugs are generally not the ones you want to grab. You should grab, the, find the person with the most bugs. Find one of his bugs, grab one of those. Because the unassigned bugs no one's paying attention to anyway. And they might be really hard, but... Um, so I started applying to Intel because I was frustrated that I couldn't fix any bugs and I knew I could help. I knew it if I could just get a hold of somebody. So I interviewed. Uh, I, I got in touch with HR and HR replied and, and said, no, thank you. 
And this baffled me. Because for the first time in my life, I felt like I was applying to a job where I could do this job. I know this thing. And this is another one of those, when you reach your limitations, ignore that limitation. Because it doesn't matter. I, I know the person whose job this was. This job was for Josh, Joshua. Joshua Locke had worked at Yocto and needed to come back. He was coming back, so they needed to post it online. So it wasn't that the manager was like, oh, I don't want this guy over here. They never saw me. So I kept banging on doors and banging on doors, and finally I contacted, and I think a lot of you know Ross, Ross Burton. I sent an email to Ross. It took a lot of courage, because I don't know Ross, to email Ross and be like, hey, Ross, how's it going? I see you've been doing this for a while. Um, I can help. Can, can you, this is my resume. Could you pa pass that on to some? I know, I know we don't know each other, but uh, I know Otavio, and you're linked to him on LinkedIn, so you know, <laughs> he says I can, I can do work, help. Um, and he did. He passed it on to Jessica, who's now my manager. And uh, within a few weeks of, uh, of interviewing, I, I got the job. And I also, in cliche fashion, also got my rejection letter from Intel. So uh, I, I both got rejected and hired. And I assure you, I, I have health insurance. I get a paycheck. But, uh, but I also got rejected. So I'm going to hold on to this, because this is my rejection for the job that I now have. And I have the rejection for the job I wanted. But either way, I work for Intel now, so it's all OK. And I was also, just to go back, the reason I love this one so much, not just because I didn't get it, the picture is beautiful. I mean, how better to tell somebody? Just, that's, you're what's next. Oh, no, I'm not. But then even if they give you the job, they're still going to say, and also, no, you're not. So, so why do I work for the Octo Project? Um, I worked for the Octo Project because I was excited to work for something open source. Uh, I love working with hardware, and one of the first things that uh, Otavio, my friend, told me was, you realize you're not going to work on hardware all the time. And I said, that's fine. I want to contribute to open source software. I don't want to consume anymore. I want to I produce. Um, the other reason was the people. Uh, these are some of my favorite quotes from our, from our bug tracker that occasionally float by. Um, the people that I work with are awesome. They're cool people. They're fun to work with. And I don't feel like when I ask questions that I'm going to be judged by my lack of knowledge. And that's a huge thing in the open source community. When I say, what's differential signaling, they don't chuckle at you and go, well, they explain it to you. Or they send you a link. Or you ask them a specific question that's really in detail that they realize it's going to take an hour to explain, but they take an hour out of your day and their day and explain it to you. I'm also excited about the direction Intel is going. I like the fact that they're developing pieces of hardware that I can get excited about. And between those two things, I feel like I found a place to hang out. I feel like I found a home. And open source software did that for me. There's no other way I could have uh, accomplished that. So really quick, summing up. Uh, whoops. Really quick. There we go. Uh, lessons learned. Uh, the learner has to take charge. If you're not banging your head against the problem, you're, you're not doing it. Don't just read the book. Put the book aside and just bang your head against the problem for a while, then pick the book back up. Let your head be sore for a bit, then put the book down and repeat. Um, solve someone's problem. Always, for, for the young people out there that are saying, how do I get a job, how do I do this, how do I do that, just find someone with a problem and solve that problem. Um, and then this last one is for my son. Limitations are like the cake. Um, it's a lie. It's the joke. Cause, yeah, anyway, um, so uh, don't pay any attention to what people say are your limits. Because people told me, you're not very good at math. And people told me, you're an artsy person. So I, I've taken that with me over the years. And I don't hold it a grudge. I hold it as a badge of honor. Because I am an artsy person. And I am not that good at math. But <laughs> it turns out I can still get by. So there's also a hidden lesson in there, although it wasn't too hidden. And I uh, don't know if any of you speak Italian, but this is one of my favorite Italian phrases. And the, the gist of this is that your friends are your most important aspect. So don't forget that. And by contributing to open source software, you are all my friends. So it is an honor to be here and to speak in front of you. So thank you. I think, do I have any time? Or? Yeah. All right, I'll yeah, take as many questions as you want. So anything regarding any of this stuff or stuff that I've worked on or just no Intel questions because I've only been there for six months and I really don't know anything yet. Ask this guy Intel questions or that guy Intel questions. <laughs> sure. Did you get uh, a lot of rejections or money bases because you didn't have an education? Yes. That is the first question in every interview. I'm probably exaggerating, but every interview I've ever been on, the first question is, 
what's with the English and French degree? And it's funny, because I actually like answering it. It's fun, because I did get a degree in English and French literature, and I learned a lot. Um, and one of the things I learned was how to critically analyze things, which is an extremely useful skill, regardless of where you are in life. So yeah, and occasionally people will kind of call into question like whether or not I know the basics, so I will get questions about like B trees and uh, C groups, and I, I, I tell them as much as I know. But the great thing is when you're applying for jobs that you want to work at, uh, your ignorance isn't your hindrance. Just here's what I know, here's what I don't know, and I can learn. And the fact that I can learn is, is evidenced by all the jobs I've had, so yeah. Did they test your French too? I actually haven't. The only job that has ever tested my French was a job waiting tables. <laughs> and I actually, I didn't even know I was being tested, but I swore at them in French. And they had such a chuckle at it that I think I got that job just for swearing at them. Um, so, yeah. Anybody else? Have you done any outreach to um, universities and stuff like that sharing your story? I haven't. In fact, one of the reasons I did this was um, I sat down with my manager when I first started at Intel. And she mentioned that one of the things that they like us to do is go out and talk. And I mean, as, as much experience as I have, there are tons of people more qualified to talk about things like all the stuff I've worked on, Java, Embedded, you name it. There are plenty of experts out there that know more about that than me. But when it comes to this, I'm, I'm an expert. <laughs> I, I know a lot about this. So yeah, this is sort of the launching point for that. I would like to become an advocate because the more I go to conferences and the more I talk to people in the industry, the more I'm amazed at, at how many of these people don't have degrees in computer science and just taught themselves. And even people with degrees in computer science will tell you that's a great foundation. It never hurts to have taken a compiler class, but nothing is as valuable as what you're going to learn when you graduate. And I mean, any, even the electrical engineers will tell you, like, nobody asks you to solve those scholastic problems in the real world. They just, they want you to get the stuff out the door. So, yeah, so I'm really excited to be able to um, use uh, these types of platforms to talk about how important it is and how many of us there are that came from that background. And then to Endless's point, um, the education part is so important. It's so important to get more kids to understand that there's that flip. Because that changed the way I looked at the world. I didn't know that all that code was available and nobody's gonna assume it is. Nobody assumes the right click button does anything. They want it to go away. They don't know why it's there. <laughs> Stupid context. Man. So, so yeah, I'm, I'd be really excited to do more uh, more work along this line, along these lines. So what is differential? Oh, what is differential? Um, so the question is, what is differential signaling? Uh, it's a good question. So, uh, what, one thing I learned at my last job was that uh, when you have to a communication line, there's often a lot of noise, and noise stinks. So a good way to get rid of noise is to have two signals rather than one signal, and then use the difference of those signals to figure out what was trying to be communicated. That way, if there's a whole bunch of noise on the line, you get sort of a you get an inherent filtering by taking the difference of those two signals. Um, so what practically uh, LVDS uh, low, low voltage differential signaling is how all our displays worked. So when the LVDS.c file, that's the one that I had to go dig through when stuff didn't work. And that's a layman's understanding of that subject right there, in case you weren't aware. Um, but that, that's the little steps you take in learning this sort of thing. Um, there's a Wikipedia has a great article. I read it once in a while just to sort of remind myself I don't understand the subject. I wish it had that summary at the top there. Yeah. Eventually, maybe I'll get my PhD someday and I could be the, that weird professor who started off with English literature and ended in computer science. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm just kind of curious. Do you ever go to like a poll after this test? See who in the room is. Oh, no, I haven't. This is the first time I've given this talk, so let's do a poll. If you have a degree in anything but science, and I mean the whole realm of science, I don't care if it's political science, <laughs> raise your hand. Nice. Yep. So. I was going to ask who got their computer science degree at the University of Stack Overflow, like I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely, especially in the embedded world, I find that. It's, it's a small number of people, but I think we're out there, and the more we talk about it, and we talk about how we learned what we learned, um, the more people will break down those barriers to entry. Um, I have two kids, and they're just great examples, because you constantly get questions for kids, but I, I've said this myself, can I do this? Or usually what you get with kids is, I can't do that. I was talking to my daughter about HTML, because she was thinking about technical writing as a possible career choice, 
And I said, well, a great thing to learn would be HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, because that would just be a great set of tools to know, and you'd be able to relate better to the programmers. And she said, yeah, but I can't learn programming. And it just, it breaks your heart as a parent, but it also breaks your heart as a technologist who came from not a, techno a technological background. Yes, you can. You can learn any of this stuff. And I think the, precon the, conceive the preconceptions that mathematics and science are hard are a fallacy, it's that teaching them is so difficult if the person isn't inherently interested. And once you get past that and the person is interested, even if they're bad at math, they can do it. It's getting past that and finding out why should they be interested. And anyone who has kids will tell you, good luck with that one. But getting people interested, and I think that's what the logo programming language was trying to do. It was trying to get people interested and trying to show them that learning, they could, you could learn when you, know, when you don't know you're doing it. You can be drawing pictures with a turtle, but you're learning trigonometry. And then when you go to do traditional trigonometry, that stuff you learned back there suddenly comes back and helps you. Anybody else? I, I find it very interesting that, you know, that I guess technologists kind of look down at liberal arts as a sort of thing. But I, I've always found being a manager who's had people who are not technologists working for me. I, I found it really fascinating because they look at the world very differently than I would. And I get a lot of interesting feedback. And just just by the problems they give me. And I, it's just, I, I think we, we sort of, uh, we, we're not, I guess, going to our full potential, so to speak, if, if, if we're not listening to all the voices. So it, it, so I, I shouldn't. I don't think we should be looking down at anybody who's got a little arts degree just yeah. because, or because that's incredibly hard. I appreciate that sentiment. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and I think it's also um, it's funny because even myself, I find myself looking at um, reading stuff about electrical engineering, reading stuff about uh, classical programming, and and thinking, wow, I wish I could have done this when I was in college. Like that's such a great time to be doing all that. But then I'll occasionally think back to the lessons I learned from college. The lessons I learned about working within systems and about analyzing complex pieces of literature. And I realized that those tools, when writing emails especially, is amazingly valuable. And communication in the open source community is generally done through text. I find it amazing how often I'll say, hey, do you want me to give you a ring? And they're like, well, we're just we're chatting right now. Why you don't call me? <laughs> don't use that tool, use this tool. So if you're writing, a knowledge of the liberal arts comes in handy. And then just for perspective, I mean, the perspective that having a liberal arts background gives you is amazing. If nothing else, it gives you an appreciation because I am still amazed every day at the stuff that's done in technology, simply from the fact that I realize I have a gap of knowledge, but also because that is really hard work for me. Some people can do it standing on their head, but others have to take an entire lifetime building a career learning these concepts. So when I see somebody talking about compilers and they're doing it effortlessly, I have to chuckle because I've watched, I've sat in on a compiler class and I still don't get it. But it's fun to try and learn and, and having that liberal arts background teaches you, you can just try. Just keep trying. Watch that class again if you didn't get it. So, yeah. Oh, sure, yeah. You see. The liberal arts can actually be I totally agree. I think the parallels between uh, the things we do in technology and the things they teach in liberal arts are so direct that if we can just break down that barrier of math and science over here, liberal arts over here, then we'll find that so many more of those connections become evident and both sides will win from it. 
Uh, when I was in college, I took a course, this is gonna show my age, I took a course called Hypertext, um, which was a literature course about hypertext. <laughs> So anyway, the, the break there between technology and liberal arts was so evident because we were all just English majors chatting about hypertext. Why were there not 10 computer science majors sitting in there so that they could help us or enlighten us on the stuff they do and we could enlighten them on the stuff that we're trying to get into their world. So that cross-pollination, um, I'm gonna blank on his name, aren't I? Um, there is a professor and I can't remember his name. Oh, Pouch, Rand, Randy Pouch. Uh, who, his whole mission was really to do that. To, how do we get the artists and the, and the technologists together? Because when you do that, you, you end up with Epcot Center. And that's really cool. Uh, anyone who's ever been to Epcot and Disney World knows that when you get artsy people together with technology people, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> you can go on some amazing rides and learn some really interesting things. So yeah, it, I guess if I had a, a 10 year goal <laughs> or a 20 year goal, it would be to that sort of mission <clears throat> statement. How do you take that liberal arts information that's so valuable and the technology information that's so valuable and merge them. And I think if, if, if more of that gets done, the better off we'll all be. I was just saying I have a similar background. The thing that I found, I did a history degree. The thing that I found transferred, um, interestingly, most over to technology. My favorite invention ever since I've started doing tech is uh, Git Lane. <laughs> and this is the thing I got missing, because when I, I debug something, I figure out why I think it's going wrong, and instead of just changing that code to how I think it should be, the thing I do, I run git blame, and I look at who committed that, and then I try and figure out why it's like that. Because the thing you learn from history, there's a quote from uh, Chesterton, and he was talking about politics, British politics, and he said, um, I'll let you, it's my opinion that you can change things in the law, you can reform things. I'm not a died in the world conservative, but before you change something, figure out why it is the way it is. Because there will be a reason, and you should understand why it's written the way it is before you try to change it, right? And that's right. a really interesting thing to bring to debugging things here. Right. I, I think that's a really interesting perspective, and I think <coughs> that sort of perspective is what you see more with liberal arts people. Uh, one of the comments I get all the time from, from programmers that are surprised by something I did is, why did you look at it that way? Well, I looked at it that way because I'd never read the book. So I don't know how it works. And they'll ask me questions like, well, what made you think to do that? Like, why would that ever have worked, even though it did? And I'll say, well, I, I, was, I was just pushing the buttons. And, <laughs> and it didn't blow up, so it couldn't have been bad, right? And I think that change of perspective is immensely important. There's a, just in reference to your art and engineering and science combination, there's a great conference out there and, and, uh, called the Bridges Organization that puts together art science exhibits and, and conferences every year. And they, they usually bounce back and forth between Baltimore and Korea and Seoul. My daughter got, had some art. She's a fractal, digital fractal artist. So she, has a, she does that, that is her passion and that, that art science intersection, art and math intersection. There's a big organization called Bridges that, that is around that whole thing. That, that's a great point to bring up. And I'm sure there are lots of organizations out there. So. I, I'll, I will do some research on that as well and add that to these slides. But I'm going to close up because we've got our next talk coming. So thank you all again, and it was an honor to be here.